Welcome to Will's Personal Development Podcast, where we bring you data and science-backed answers and advice from billionaires. What's up, everyone? My name is Will, and I'm excited. I'm beyond excited right now because I'm recording this at the start of the new year. And what comes with New Year's but New Year's resolutions? And this is an exciting time because it reminds me of how far ahead I get and how far I have to go. And it's an extra reminder to really get those uh, goals into place and really execute on them so I succeed. The New Year's is a time where, for me, I see a lot of people set goals that they never achieve. And so for me, that really reminds me that I can't let that happen, that I can't just set goals January. I have to set them every month. And that's what I do. And that's why I don't do New Year's resolutions myself, because I'm always setting goals. I'm always achieving them. And to be successful, you can't be like the people I see. And I see it all the time. Uh, I've seen it for the last few weeks now into January because this always happens. I've seen this happen for years and years and years, uh, especially at the gym. Everyone just floods the gym starting January, and you can just see the madness of the crowds. They're just trying to, you know, a whole year has passed, and they are reminded, and they rem- they think, I'm a year older, and I haven't accomplished anything. So they set out to go to the gym, and sure enough, I bet you, That's come February, I've seen this happen every year, 95% of those people stop coming to the gym. And uh, a similar thing happens at a smaller scale every Monday, uh, every first Monday of the week, uh, especially the first week of the month. I see this uh, consistently when I go to the gym. And, uh, you know, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, We... In this talk, uh, this uh, podcast, we're going to be covering 10 books for the rest of your life. And one of those books will help you, uh, with what I have been able to do, which is, uh, set a routine of consistent, uh, habitual, you know, exercise and weightlifting at the gym, as well as other great habits, even Though I've struggled with it for years, I've finally been able to achieve it, and I've been consistently going to the gym for a, a while now, um, uh, consistently. And you know, it won't solve everything. I don't think a book will solve everything. I picked up some stuff outside of these books, but what's inspired me to come up with this list is uh, I noticed that a lot of people were wondering if I could only recommend one book or three books or 10 books for the rest of your life, what 10 books would they be? That's right. If you could only read 10 books for the rest of your life, what books would they be? Now, there's variations on this question. You know, some people just want one book. Some people want three. Uh, I decided to tackle 10. Some, I think... Some people want like a hundred. What are the top 100 or what are the top 40 books that I can read? And those are the only books I can read for my entire life. I think what they're trying to really get at here, I'm just, uh, you know, guessing here, but they just want me to really uh, prioritize for them and decide what are the most important books for them to read. Uh, not saying that they will only read 10, which I think is a good thing to do. You should never like limit yourself to just like three books, but uh, there is incredible importance in, I do agree, repeating a book or reading it slowly and taking notes and then rereading it. Uh, and I think it's highly underemphasized in the modern times. I think uh, a lot of people I know in the self-help industry uh the trend right now uh, is to you know promote this idea of quantity over quality which you know i've experimented with and um i p- prefer results over showing off and when i really looked at what i had accomplished 
by speed reading or using my speed, the speed reading tactics I learned or by, you know, playing audiobooks at three times speed, I realized I wasn't picking up as much knowledge and as, as much results as if I slowed down and reviewed what I read. So I switched it up even if, you know, I couldn't brag that I read, you know, a book every two days or something like that. So my, my current tr- rate is about two per week, uh, which has slowed down, but it's still uh, pretty fast for most people. Uh, anyhow, I'm going to stop rambling here and I'm going to give it to you. Now, these are 10 books uh, for the rest of your life. The top 10 books that I would suggest if you could only pick 10 for the rest of your life. I have them listed out here. And let me just make a quick distinction here. I've done lists like this, but they're not the same. For example, I did a list on uh, top 10 books that would change your life. Um, and that list, uh, which you can find on my blog, willyoulaugh.com, that list is different because that's on books that you want to read if you want your life changed, if you want a complete pivot in direction. And of course, that list is more geared on, you know, learning what's needed to be learned in life and making that switch versus this list is more about, you know, what are the pillar books that uh, you should read if you really want to have something that you keep uh, going back to for foundational, fundamental reading that will constantly help you improve in life. And it's similar to Bible type books, I would say. And so it, there's a clear difference here. One is for sort of lifelong improvement and uh, lifelong movement towards success versus the other list is more about like pivotal changes and realizations. So don't get it wrong. Don't think that uh, they're the same list. Now, uh, before I jump in, I also want to give a bit of credibility because you might be wondering, well, why should I trust you? Why? How many books have you read? Uh, and I think this is a fantastic question because uh, you don't know. And so I should tell you. So the first big thing is that uh, for me, I've, as you can probably tell, read a lot Uh Some of it is through audiobooks, some of it is through actual print books, and I would say within the last three years, I've read around 150 books, and I'm not saying this to brag at all. Um, It's just to, uh, you know, explain to you that I'm not someone who's only read like three books, and then I'm just like picking out random books uh, based off their summaries online that I haven't really read myself to generate some viral list. And unfortunately, if you go online, that's what 95% of the viral articles you see online, that's what they do. And it doesn't take me long since I've actually read most of those books in the self-help industry. Uh, I can kind of tell if the author of that article, fairly quickly usually, whether or not they've actually read the top 10 books or the top 50 books that they're recommending. And usually, uh, especially, you know, if you go to these viral website articles uh, where they just like churn out like top 10 lists every day, uh, it's very clear to me that that's what they do. They haven't read the actual books. They've just done a little bit of research, picked a few books based off their synopsis or their Wikipedia summary, and then they plopped it up. And of course, they get very... um erroneous summaries they're off they're not actually accurate and the reviews on how good the book is is off so that's where i'm coming from and i think uh you know i have a fairly uh comprehensive grasp on personal development so i think i can really help you out uh just to give you a little bit of structure so when when i'm talking personal development here um here's what that really means it really breaks down to um a f- couple central pillars that we all strive towards. One is wealth. Another is happiness. A third would be, um, you know, mastery and performance, which you can arguably put under a subset of wealth, but not necessarily. You know, money doesn't necessarily mean success 
Uh, so a th- third one would be mastery at a skill set or craft or, or, or be, to become successful at something. And then maybe the fourth one uh, would be relationships and dating. Uh, so, uh, you know, that those are like the, you know, big four pillars, uh, health, wealth, dating, happiness, and arguably there's like a fifth one, which is uh, intelligence or wisdom. But for me, that's always come very naturally. Like when you've really read as many books as I have, like just, um, just being interested in and reading them, you naturally become smarter. And for me, that's really not an issue. It's a non-issue. And arguably there's a sixth pillar, which is health. Uh, they're all foundational pillars and, uh, we're not going to be covering health. Why? Because there's a million fitness websites and podcasts, uh, and that industry is saturated. So we're not going to be covering health and fitness advice that much. There is one book on this list that does cover health. Uh, but generally speaking, my content doesn't because there's just so much out there. I think it's really important. I do think fitness uh, is a huge investment that will pay off in the short run and long term to do all sorts of great stuff, give you more energy than you invested, give you more time back, make you live longer, give you more focus, et cetera, et cetera. I know a lot about fitness, but it's just not my focus. Uh, so what we're going to be focusing on really is wealth accumulation. Uh, mastery is a big one. Uh, and happiness is probably the biggest. And we'll, we'll touch lightly on dating as well. I have one book in these, in this list of top 10 that is a dating book. And so let's just get started. I, I really think, uh, this list will provide a lot of value to you. I know you, you've been, you're probably waiting on the edge of your seat to, to hear these 10 books that I would recommend if you could only read 10 books for the rest of your life. Uh, again, th- this list is tailored from what I have read and what I know about. So I have a pretty thorough universe about books um, in this space, more than like 99% of people. So uh, I'm pretty, I think it's it's a solid list, though there could be something I missed on there. It's not a perfect list. And maybe in a year or two, I might tweak it a bit. But nonetheless, this will get you far. Uh, so I'm not going to hold the suspense any longer. Let's start with number one, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a book that I would consider a beginner fundamental book on how wealthy people think differently than poor people and how those mindset shifts and beliefs translate over into money. Uh, now, is it a perfect book? No. Uh, is it definitely more so a beginner book? Yes, but uh, no other book I can think of uh, was a better gateway book into introducing and really instilling uh, the polarizing differences between wealthy people and poor people. And, you know, I pictured this list uh, when I was thinking of books to put on this list of 10. Uh, I started with the premise that the person reading these uh, was a complete beginner. He had, hadn't read a single book on this. And therefore, it's something that's more so on the beginner side to really get you started. Would I consider this something of like, uh, extreme meaty, important read? It's fun. It's story filled. It's real. It's based on actual stories. So here's the premise of the book. So the author, his name's Robert Kiyosaki. And, uh, by the way, don't read his other books. I've read his other books. They're not as, they're not as good at all. Um, they get into like weird real estate stuff. And then he keeps telling you that, um, real estate is the only way to go and make, to make money, which I don't think is true. And, uh, so I would not recommend reading his other books because it, it gets weird. But in terms of this book, which is his most famous, it is insanely good. And here's the premise of the book. Uh, it's such an amazing premise too. So Robert, he grew up in Hawaii and he had his real dad who was a typical nine to five employee and he had his best friend's dad as a sort of, you know, 
mentor figure as well. So he had two mentor figures growing up, and his uh, best friend's dad was very different. He was a entrepreneur and very wealthy. And by the time, uh, you know, both of those dads died, one owned like most of Hawaii, and then the other died in debt and passed on that debt to his family. So the one who was his quote unquote poor dad was his actual biological natural father. And his, you know, rich dad was his best friend's dad. So why did this occur? It's, it's such an interesting premise. Of course, the book goes into more detail. I'm just giving you a little bit of a teaser here, but, uh, they had completely different mindsets and attitudes. And then, you know, the, his poor dad was always complaining about life, blaming others for why he wasn't rich and, you know, locked into a system that just wouldn't make him money. And it was something where he, you know, had all these bad mindsets. For example, one of the biggest ones that I still remember is, um, he said that, uh, If he wanted to be rich or if he wanted to buy something expensive, then he had to, you know, steal or lie or, you know, work hard or sacrifice family time versus the rich dad. He took a different mindset. He said, well, how can I get that without, you know, of course, sacrificing fundamental things that you don't have to, like, you know, your health or, you know, not seeing your family for a year because you worked yourself to death. Uh, so there's actually a really good section of a book that I think is just iconic. Look out for it if you read it, where he just lists out a list of all the things poor people think and then, you know, flip it and do a, you know, 180 and then um, take that same situation and say what a rich person would think instead. And it's almost like um, a poem because it's just like so well done. And I, I remember one of the lines was something like um, a poor person would say, I can't afford that. But a rich person would say, how can I afford that? And it's just like a simple flip of phrasing. But it changes your mindset, which changes your attitude, beliefs, and actions. Because one guy just gives up, whereas the second guy looks to try and make it happen. Let's move on to number two, which is uh, the second book I recommend, Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. Uh, great book. Now, Napoleon Hill, uh, he sold tens of millions of copies of his books. And his most famous by far is Think and Grow Rich. And anyone in the like wealth accumulation uh, and self-help industry probably has heard of him and his book, Think and Grow Rich. And you're probably wondering why I'm not recommending that one. Well, the answer is simple. Think and Grow Rich was a simple pamphlet version of the laws of success. You see, Napoleon Hill, uh, he spent his entire life studying the world's most successful people in the world. And I, I know I've mentioned this numerous times in previous podcasts, but I want to emphasize this because I think it's really important. Uh, he spent his whole life studying the richest people in the world. We're talking Ford, Edison, Rockefeller, Carnegie, people that names that we still remember to this day. And they were straight up richest people in the world by far. Inflation adjusted may be even richer than the richest people alive now. Uh, and the point is that uh, after like 25 plus years, he wrote his first book, which was this monolithic. Uh, it actually isn't that big. People think it's huge, but it's it's a decent size. It's about three times uh, thicker than Think and Grow Rich. Um and that was his first book. And it was his A to Z book on how anyone can become rich. And basically, you know, he spent his whole life, he's like 25 years studying this. And he took it from a very scientific viewpoint. He asked questions like, can anyone become rich? And if so, what did they have to do? And it's it's basically a book that states that, you know, unless you're mentally retarded or you have like, you know, 
no, none of your five senses, you, you can become rich. And he kind of like lays it out in the book, A to Z, from beginning to end. And the problem was, uh, it was a depression like time. People weren't making much money. And so no one bought the book. Plus it was just way too long. No one wanted to read it. So after a few years, he wrote a condensed version, Think and Grow Rich. And that one just sold like hotcakes. Uh, but the problem is it's not the comprehensive, complete guide to becoming rich. And people, uh, treat it like it is, which is, a shame because it's kind of like reading a brochure and thinking like that's all that's offered when there's so much more guidance and value available. So of course it's longer and uh, one of the big issues with the book is that everyone who reads any of Napoleon Hill's books for that matter, uh, 90% of them, like they just read it, they forget most of it and they don't do exactly what he says in the book. Uh, which is interesting because I would say 99% of people in the general public I meet have never even heard of Napoleon Hill. Uh, and those who have and have read the book, which, you know, there's still, that still means millions have, um, of those who have like very few actually do it verbatim or even close to it. Like there's all these like specific rules. Like you have to meet with your mastermind twice a week uh, that no one really follows, even rich people who have claimed to read the book, which I think is a very interesting thing. Um, I think uh, if I were able to accomplish this, I am not there yet. Um, maybe there's even more wealth than most people have ever achieved that's available. Um, there's, I think it's just the fact that even rich people are lazy. I know a few rich people who I know for sure, they're not following Napoleon Hill's all of his rules and directions, uh, even though they claim that they love the book and they've read it and, you know, it's one of their favorite books. So I think it's really important to f follow everything. And I, I'm going to be one of the first people to do that and see what happens. And I recommend the reason I'm bringing this up is because I recommend that you try and do the same thing, at least. At least try and follow one direction in the book. Don't be like one of those people who reads it and doesn't do a single thing in the book. And that goes for all the rest of these uh, books on this list. Uh, and again, don't get overwhelmed by this list either. Just take it one page at a time at your own comfortable pace. Let's move on to book three. Uh, and this is the final book I'm going to give you that's specifically geared towards... Uh, making money and it is the millionaire next door now this book is quite interesting uh it's a very scientific analysis in-person analysis of thousands of millionaires it was the most widely you know largest group analysis of millionaires ever done the book's decades old but uh it still is easy to read the english is still understandable there's very little like old english that you have to deal with it's pretty understandable and i mean the one word to describe the book when i read it and i think other people have a would have a similar reaction is surprise i was shocked and um, if you don't mind, I'm going to give a tiny spoiler to the book, uh, but I think it's, it should be done to kind of make you want to read the book. But when I finished the book, I, I was shocked because I thought I had the, these preconceived notions about who a millionaire was and how they acted. And the book shattered that idea completely. Uh, what I learned was that, you know, a great majority of millionaires did it over an extended period of time by saving and investing their money slowly and not spending it lavishly at all. 
And what I learned was that that 1% of millionaires, usually it's an actor or celebrity of some sort. Those are the ones who give other millionaires a skewed stereotype and sometimes a bad reputation because those are the ones who are like buying all these flashy cars and spending all their money like crazy and, you know, buying all this weird stuff like expensive food that they don't need like caviar and all this weird stuff. Uh, I believe I ate caviar once in my life. I can't remember how. I think it was at like some like, uh, organization event or something, but it tastes horrible. Apparently it's like one of those rich people foods like, uh, champagne. Uh, I've tried champagne too. It, it, a lot of hype it doesn't taste bad. It tastes like crappy eggs. And anyhow, like there's this one scene in the book where they, um, they invited like, uh, a dozen millionaires to meet for a, you know, analysis and they bought all this like caviar and uh rich people food that they assumed that these people would eat and then in walks like 12 like normal looking people and they're like um we're not going to eat that caviar do you have any burgers and so long story short a lot of very startling insights about millionaires uh they're not flashy they don't buy fancy cars. They don't eat weird, you know, bizarre foods. And they're, most of them are not like that stereotype that you see. So it really helped me uh, understand more about what the actual millionaire is like and a lot more about the world, which I think is really cool. Let's move on to number four. I wish I could just talk and talk. I probably could talk about each of these books for at least half an hour, but uh, I have to start moving here. Now we've moved on from wealth creation books. Now we're going to going into regrets. This is a book I've recommended before, but I think it's still so important uh, because success in life goes beyond just making money. The book is Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And of course, some of the, those regrets that she does mention in the book are directly tied to the making of money. You see, you can make money, but you still fail in life um, and be unsuccessful by not living up to what you've always wanted to do, but lack the courage to do, or not pursuing your passion. Uh, and I'll give you a great story. So yesterday, I was reading a book by the... Un, almost undisputed best chess player of all time. He held uh, the world championship and number one ELO rating in chess for over 20 years. His name is Gary Kasparov. And he actually wrote a book on success in life. He said, it's the books about um, success in life and decision making and uh, his transition to politics after his chess career. The book's called How Life Imitates Chess. This isn't one of the books that I'm recommending. This is just to set up the story. Um, so I'm reading this book by uh, Gary, uh, and it's called How Life Imitates Chess. And I looked up a few uh, speeches he did and watched them on YouTube just because I was interested. And one of his speeches was uh, titled How to Unleash Your Potential. And... In the speech, he started off by saying how unleashing your success in life is not the same thing as as becoming rich. And he 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 started talking about how if you let's say have a gift and potential to become one of the greatest artists of all time. You, but you give that up to make a lot of money doing something you hate in finance. I mean, you could be rich and successful in that sense, but overall in life, you're not successful. And he made a great point that, again, has been echoed by many successful people. And I think it's such an important point that although I really respect people like Gary who understand this really well, but a lot of people don't until the end of their life. 
and so I really recommend this book. Uh, the author, Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, of course, um, one of the regrets she mentions is what I just said. The, the whole uh, choosing... Uh, ha- not having the courage to pursue what you wanted and going after something your parents or someone else wanted. And I think Jack Welch said it best. I think he's a very wise individual. And, you know, I've spent a long time thinking about this topic because I've spent years struggling with following your passion and that whole uh, movement behind it to really figure out the answer. Should you follow your passion? Shouldn't you? And what I finally came to after reading a lot of books on the topic was uh, what Jack Welch said, which is that uh, there are a lot of factors in life. Sometimes you have to be more practical and put food on the table. Sometimes you can f- follow your passion and you're lucky enough to have a talent and passion that also pays. Other times, at least temporarily, uh, you don't. So you have to compromise a bit. And so if you do, Jack Welch says, then suck it up, come to terms with it, and just do it. And then maybe later in life, if you can transition to something that pays and is also something that you enjoy and is maybe less taxing or stressful, then you can transition to that as well. Uh, but it's important to keep an open eye out and, you know, come to terms with that and not complain if you are stuck in a situation where you decided to take something more practical. Uh, which I think is a great philosophy. And I, that's pretty much the conclusion I came to. Uh, so that's a long ramble. I kind of got off track. But long story short, I recommend the book Top 5 Regrets of the Dying. The author is very credible. She's a nurse who uh, worked at a nursing home for um, many, many, many years and saw hundreds of people die and noticed very common patterns on what they regretted most. Um, another regret, I don't want to spoil them, was um, saying, uh, not, you know, holding grudges too long and not saying and apologizing. Uh, so, great book and highly credible. And you learn a lot, not just about regrets, uh, but happiness too. I think the, the author, there's this one story in the book where she literally is just so happy to be alive because she, the author went through like uh, a near death experience with cancer. And it, it was a very uh, stark story because she was just humming and enjoying life because she was alive and she had to work with a very bitter, um, bitter senior citizen who hated life and was very frustrated. She, this senior citizen was dealt very tough cards in life and you see this whole dynamic and their conversation and exchange and it really gets you thinking about life and happiness and attitude Uh, so again a little bit of a teaser the book is not long i would say it's about 200 pages it's a short read uh easy to read um not coffee table it's a little bit longer than that it's not a coffee table book but uh it shouldn't take you too long, so don't be intimidated here. Uh, now let's move on to number five. The fifth book I recommend is 50 Secrets of the Longest Living People. Uh, this book is self-explanatory. So one avenue of living longer is health. And one avenue of success, I mean, is is health. And one avenue of health is living longer. Uh, of course, you know, if you have reached success and you're enjoying life and having fun, then of course you want to live longer because we're only given one life. And if we screw it up and we have regrets or we die earlier because of something that we kept, uh, that we could have controlled, then that's on us. I mean, if you get, if you have something out of your control happen, whether it's cancer, you know, that's something out of your control. But if it's something you can control, like your health and how long you live, what food you put into your body so you don't get heart attacks, uh, maybe even being a little safer on the road so you don't get hit by a car, that's your responsibility. Uh, these 50 secrets are really good. Uh, I've gone through this book. Uh, I would say skimmed. I didn't read every single word. But I've gone through this book numerous times. And uh, it's one of those semi-coffee table books because um, 
it's kind of like it's very like it's bullet point esque. Like each of the fifty tips are listed in paragraph essay format, but nonetheless, it's something where you can easily hop in and out of. Uh, these secrets、uh, span everything from your attitude towards life and stress. Uh, your lifestyle to what you eat, what you shouldn't eat, like cheeses, what you should maybe eat more of, like tomatoes and onions, how you should cook your food, and what type of cooking methods you should avoid.、Uh, spoiler alert: fried foods avoid, boiled foods good.、Uh, so it covers a lot of things. You know what types of foods to eat: baked potatoes, sweet potatoes. Uh, and on and on and on. I think it's a really great book, and I think it's something that may be a bit overwhelming. It was for me. I think fifty was a lot of things to handle, and、uh, you definitely could get a little bit too、uh, OCD, too over controlling, or over perfectionist、uh, by trying to do them all. Because like, I don't think anyone really does them all. There is no perfect. Like、uh, the book was.、Uh, Made by studying some of the longest-lived tribes across the world, from Africa to Okinawa, Japan, and what you'll notice is that there's a lot of convergence there. But uh, some of those uh, tips, uh, some of those secrets, are from one specific tribe. So even within that tribe, they're not doing all 50 of the secrets themselves. So don't get overwhelmed. Don't try and create some type of concoction,、uh, food concoction that has like 23 of the 23 food secrets of the longest living people. Because I don't even think the longest living people themselves are that anal about it or perfectionist about it. So just keep that in mind、uh, as you read the book. Now we're moving into the domain of happiness. Now this is a、uh, domain that I think is probably one of the most important domains because, at the end of the day, I think most people want their children to be happy above all else. They want themselves to be happier, happy beyond、uh, rich or anything else. So I think happiness is a you know one of the pillars of personal development that I think. Uh, is towards the top. It's it's higher than wealth. It's higher than、uh, maybe even mastery or you know general success in life or even dating and relationships.、Uh, arguably, all of them are interrelated, and you can argue that living a rich life requires all of them, and you can have all of them, believe it or not. So,、uh, the book I recommend.、Uh, Is the how of happiness. Now, the reason why I chose this book、uh, is because I spent so many years studying happiness, and this has got to be the best, one of the best books I've found on happiness. You see,、uh, my struggle with happiness、uh, for a few years, I would say maybe a couple,、uh, about three or four years, and I. Was very confused about it. I asked a lot of different people from different backgrounds about it, and I got a lot of opinions. But I just wasn't sure. I I was skeptical about their opinions. How? Why should I trust them? Why was their advice fact, or was it just was it just opinions?、Uh, and of course, you get all different types of answers.、Uh, some people will say, you know, it comes from. Uh, religion. It comes from this or that, and、uh, so I I wanted to see if science had anything to say because science has a very rigorous、um, process to test what works and doesn't. And long story short, I went through a lot of books and lectures and TED talks and videos and books, lots of books on happiness, and some of them were like they had the best title ever. But then, when you read the book, you were like, "What the heck is this?" It's like, okay, it covers like one part of it, but I don't think it's the full A to Z on happiness.、Uh, like one of the one of the books on happiness I read, like there's literally only like two actual scientific studies referenced in the book, even though like、um, the title made it seem like the whole book would be about you know the science of happiness, and then like、uh, most of the books. 
random anecdotal stories about the author's own life, and you're like, this is no no good. Uh, but then um, you meet you, you. I finally found uh, stumble across the how of happiness, um, and it's exactly how it sounds. It t- will teach you how to become happier in the long term, not fake delight or pleasure. I think a lot of people confuse the two. Um, a lot of people. In fact, I was reading the book Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. Again, don't get confused by the names. Uh, Tony Shea, he's the founder of Zappos. It's a, uh, a very successful shoe online company where you could buy shoes online. Uh, it was acquired by Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com. And despite the name, it has, it's really not about the science of happiness or happiness at all. It's about, um, how he built, uh, his successful businesses and the ones that came before Zappos. Uh, anyhow, I was reading that book and even this guy who's worth millions of dollars, uh, he made some, uh, false distinctions. He made a, a mistake on happiness. He, he started talking about how, um, uh, you feel happiness when you open up a box of fresh shoes. And I thought to myself, that's not happiness. That's temporary pleasure, temporary delight. Now, uh, that is a topic for another day. It's called the hedonic adaptation. And uh, there's a reason why that happiness doesn't last. Again, I've touched on it in much further detail in previous podcast episodes if you want to check those out but long story short um the how of happiness that book actually goes into how you can achieve real legitimate happiness for a long term um it's fairly thoroughly a to z there is a couple small things that were not mentioned in the book that i did pick up from ted talks um that i believe are uh, just as good. Again, if you want like the A to Z article on it, I wrote an article on everything I learned that's worth knowing about happiness based on science. Uh, you could go to willyoulaugh.com slash happy for that. If you just want a summary and you, you're too lazy to read the how of happiness. But if you do read the how of happiness, um, I really think uh, it will really help you because it's, it's it literally goes through like uh, all the fundamental things that will bring you happiness, uh, based on like extensive, uh, you know, s- study of thousands of individuals as they were tested throughout life and, and told to do these things. And the most amazing part about it, I think the most magical, and it's also the reason why I see a lot of people who are broke, who I've met who are broke or they're not rich at all and they're still happy it's uh it's because a lot of the principles and techniques to build happiness don't require money they thing it's, it's stuff like um gratitude exercises uh giving your time and sometimes money or energy to other people uh through volunteering uh there's stuff like uh savoring the moment uh there's you know small things that you're like, wow, I didn't think this would bring me happiness. It doesn't cost anything to meditate or have a gratitude journal. Uh, You don't even need the journal. Like you could do it in your head, but like really list out in detail 10 specific things you're grateful for uh, every day and you will be a lot happier. In fact, um, another study was actually done that proved that if you just did it once a week, uh, you don't get any extra benefits from doing it more than once a week. So uh, just do it once a week. Uh, again, the book goes into a lot more detail on the other tips, but gratitude is a great one. Number seven, the seventh book I recommend is Mindset, the Psychology of Success by Carol Dweck. Uh, this book has been recommended by Bill Gates. Uh, it's made its way into the self-help community roughly um, four, four-ish years ago. Ever since, I think Bill Gates was the one who really popularized it. He uh, wrote an article about it on his blog, uh, GatesNotes.com. And that kind of just blew it up out of the water. And it's actually really good. And a lot of CEOs and self-help people have 
uh, and influencers have mentioned it. And it's well worth it. It, it deserves mentioning. Basically, uh, Carol, who's a you know very successful, um, uh, I think she's a professor and psychologist, but um, she's basically studied this through her experiments. So she did all these studies on children and adults, and she found something called a growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And the growth mindset is uh, when you believe that uh, even if you suck now, that if you challenge yourself you can, and you work hard, you can improve and get better at something. Whereas fixed mindset people believe that you, everything is kind of fixed from birth, that there's no way that you can really improve your situation or skills in life, and you give up easily. And, of course, the fixed mindset people are unsuccessful in life. But if if you look at the, the growth mindset people, they grow up to succeed in life. And there's all these like little studies that, that uh, prove this. And there's this like really good one where uh, they studied children. And basically, uh, they gave two groups of children problems that were just so much harder than they could possibly ever deal with. They were math problems. And both children failed them. Uh, but the growth mindset group, uh, one group was growth mindset children and the other was uh, fixed mindset children. The growth mindset children, uh, they pretty much went on to uh, like stay energized and enthusiastic and excited for the next challenge. And when they then went on to present both groups with manageable math problems, the fixed mindset people gave up without even trying or really even looking or attempting the problems at all, even though they were now problems that they couldn't manage. And it go, it, it uh, goes into a concept called learned helplessness, which is actually, that's a concept that has been uh, already discovered um, by uh, the people in the self-help industry for decades now. I think scientists are really kind of, uh, scientists like M- Mrs. Dweck, are really just catching up, but it's it's called learn helplessness. And basically, what it, the concept means is that um, you learn to be helpless, even if you're not helpless anymore. It's kind of like the ugly duckling syndrome, but for helplessness. Uh, and a great analogy to explain this would be uh, the story of the elephant and. Uh, there's like variations, like different animals, but the the, the main idea of the story is that um, uh, again, there's a lot of people tell it differently with different animals, but the main idea is that uh, uh, when an elephant is a baby, it's like really small and weak, so the owners will tie it to like uh, a stick that's stuck to the ground. And for most of its childhood, it will struggle and push as hard as it can to escape that stick. Uh, but then when it reaches adulthood, it has already given up. Uh, uh, but now this elephant is like enormous. It weighs over a ton. It's really strong. However, it's learned to be helpless, even though it has grown to a state where it can easily rip off that stick if it wanted to. But he still believes, as he did when he was a child, that he can't rip himself off of that stick. So that same type of learned helplessness uh, happens with humans and other animals. And you can't let that uh, happen to you. Because what if you can now accomplish all these things, but you're limiting your potential because you have that learned helplessness, that ugly duckling syndrome, and you still believe that you can't accomplish something because you couldn't as a child or you were told some false information by a parent or a teacher as a child that you bought into. The eighth book I recommend is Emotional Intelligence. Uh, this book was released a few decades ago. It's one of the oldest ones on the list. But again, we're covering now the domain of uh, sort of mastery at life. Um, again, Carol Dweck's book and this book, Emotional Intelligence, will kind of really help you succeed in life in general and your skill sets and crafting and making yourself 
uh, better and better at what you do, your, your unique ability, your specific skill that you want to hone and become uh, world class or at least move towards becoming world class at. Uh, and this book, when it was released, it just ripped apart the world, especially the entrepreneurial world. And then it just kind of died down a bit. And then uh, now it's kind of like resurfaced a bit somewhat. Um, and there's still a moderate amount of hype around it because it is still an amazing concept that was discovered by science. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of one of those things that's like niche. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, if you go to, uh, the general public and you walk out on like a public street, nine out of 10 people would have never heard of it. But within the millions of people who read self help, or are really into the entrepreneur space, they know about this book because it's really helpful. So why is this book so amazing, even though it's pretty old? Uh, basically, for most of, you know, the 19th and 20th century, uh, a good portion of human you know, civilization, people believed that the only measure of success in life, uh, you can argue success is wealth or success in general. I, I would say they believe both either way. They believe that success in life was only correlated with IQ. The smarter you were, were the more successful you were. And of course, uh, when emotional intelligence came out, it kind of just ripped that model and kind of not disproved it, but kind of said that's not entirely true. And what they discovered was that emotional intelligence uh, through studies was just as important, if not more important, to success in life. Emotional intelligence is a form of intelligence around uh, identifying, understanding your emotions and other people's feelings and emotions in social settings and career and professional settings to better navigate and, uh, you know, communicate and interact with people uh, so that uh, you, you all as a community get the best possible outcome. And EQ, as it's called, uh, what really sets it apart is that everyone... Knows that IQ is fixed and really can't be changed. It's genetic, but EQ is highly changeable. So it gave people hope. It gave people who, um, thought that like life was fixed and you couldn't really do anything and hard work wouldn't help improve your success in life. It gave people hope that, Hey, maybe I can improve, uh, my situation and results in life if I improve my EQ. And that was one of the big appeals to EQ. It, it was uh, proven to be, uh, you were able to increase it with work and practice. So that was really exciting and amazing. Um, of course, uh, as a bonus, I also think there's a second book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by a different author uh, that I think is also really good. Uh, so I would recommend reading them both. Uh, both are really good and uh, I would say within the last five to 10 years, th the whole area around this has opened up even more. And they've, uh, scientifically and also just through, uh, popular writers like Malcolm Gladwell, uh, they've kind of opened up and disproven this whole simplistic idea that success is all about how smart you are, which, Nowadays, it's, it seems so obvious that that's not true. Uh, and they've blown it up to a point where, uh, they've now discovered that it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, there's apparently all these different types of intelligence, musical, uh, physical, kinesthetic, practical, social intelligence, uh, emotional, of course. And so you kind of just, it's, it's very different than, was once first assumed. And then Malcolm Gladwell cited in his book, Outliers, uh, this incredible study that tracked through the entire lifespan uh, of the individual, this whole group of uh, the world's highest IQ children. And what they found was like 
literally startling. They found that uh, uh, some of these people were no were not successful at all. In fact, they were uh, at the bottom rungs of society in some instances, like garbage collectors. And so it, it, it was really shocking because, you know, these people were tested as the highest IQ individuals as children. And sure enough, they were winning awards left and right as children. But then when they grew up, like it, it all just kind of shifted apart. So um, it kind of like blows everything up, like certain theories about the world and what, what brings success. It's it's like not necessarily like it's there's multiple factors at play. How socially intelligent are are you? Do you get along with people? How hard do you work? Are you enthusiastic with what you do? Um, so I think that's really important to, and it's, it's inspiring to me at least, because it gives people like us hope. The ninth book I recommend, uh, is The Power of Habit. Again, this is also around the domain of mastery in life. Uh, as Warren Buffett says, uh, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are so heavy that they can't be broken. And he also has this great quote that, again, he says this like all the time uh, in his interviews. Uh, he, he kind of repeats himself a lot in interviews. But uh, again, I, I would say it's because most people don't watch multiple interviews of Warren Buffett like I do. But um, he he basically says that uh, one of the most important things that you should get done and get right when you're young is habits because that's what governs our days. We're creatures of habits. And of course, uh, it's arguably harder when you're older. So, uh, I would say the only, one of the only, uh, there's maybe one or two other decent books on habit with actual, like comprehensive scientific, you know, backing, but I would say this is one of the number one books on the topic, The Power of Habit. If you want to instill good habits, this is a great starting book for it. It's, it's a fundamental book on habits. I think it's well-written. There's stories in it. And the basic idea concept is that there's uh, a trigger, a cue, and a reward. And that's how all habits are formed. And if you could just swap out the reward – actually, no, sorry. Uh, swap out the routine – in the middle, while keeping the trigger and reward the same, you could turn a bad habit into a good one. And of course, it, you can turn a no habit into a habit by adding a trigger and reward. So I think it's an interesting concept. Will it on its own guarantee you to have all these incredible habits? No, but I think it's a good starting place to get you started um, and get you farther ahead than most people. Uh, I don't think habits alone will guarantee you a success in life. Uh, I think there's, there's more to it than just being able to get to the gym every day or show up. It, you know, I mean, you, there's all sorts of other stuff you can do once you get there to push harder, work harder, learn faster, you know, over deliver. But, uh, nonetheless, um, getting there and actually doing it on a consistent basis, uh, is really important. I think, you know, uh, habits are really important, but I think um, there's certain people in the personal development influencer space, um, and they're just like so obsessed with habits. Like that's the only thing that will bring you success. And uh, I would like to pose a contrary stance and say that it's important, but on its own, will it like guarantee success and everything? No. Now, the tenth book that I recommend on this list uh, is one I. Just wanted to throw in there because um, it's been a huge impact for me. But for you guys, it may not be because maybe you're not a guy. But I had to throw this in there because I think it's really important. Uh, and it's on dating, uh, the last pillar of success. Uh, now, this book is specifically for men. So uh, if there's any ladies watching, I'm sorry. But stay tuned because I do have six books, uh, extra bonus books to mention on my honorable mentions list. Uh, the book that I'm recommending, number 10, is Mate, Become the Man Women Want by Tucker Max. And this book uh, really hits home for me for a lot of different reasons. One is because of 
Uh, the years I spent reading like really crappy, like like dating at the time, I thought it was great. It was like modern. It was new. It was the first time in the world where people were giving dating advice, and it was this new thing called the internet. Um, but uh, I spent years reading like ebooks, articles, uh, v- watching videos. Uh, you know all this like dating advice, and the problem with it was that. Um, I didn't realize this until I read this book, Mate, was that a lot of it was like crappy and bad advice for a lot of reasons. The biggest being that it wasn't real rigorous scientific, uh, you know, tested, uh, information and advice. It was at best a pseudoscience. Um, uh, you know, a lot of dating coaches will claim that they have a very scientific process and they crack the code to attraction through the science of attraction. And that's just not true. At best, what they did was a pseudoscience. They would fling stuff against the wall without controlling for uh, all the variables, not even most of the variables or factors. I mean, it's hard to do. And they wouldn't like, and they would, you know, find, find what worked best for them. And then they would give advice to others on that uh but when you take a really rigorous like science actual science has a very rigorous process with controlled variables uh to test this and of course uh, it has its limitations too but um it really revealed a lot of things that were very contradictory uh to what i still think is um a lot of it's modern and highly held mainstream dating advice stuff like uh, that the only way to meet girls uh, successfully uh, is to go to a bar or nightclub uh, which is ridiculous because most people don't live like that but i bought into that for a long time uh, and i thought for a while that i had to uh, you know just wait until one day i could move uh, to a place that had one So, I mean, there's all these like iconoclastic ideas in a book and scientific backing. Of course, there's a a couple other books that I think the book um, really sources from. So um, if you want to dive into even deeper science, check out the book, Why Women Have Sex and Why Beautiful People Have Daughters. Those two books are, are really scientific and I believe mate that book sources from those two books. So uh, incredible book. And it really takes a highly different spin on it because there's all the science behind it. And it goes into all these details that are really different, like um, that I've never heard from any other books. Like this whole idea that like uh, women are uh, unconsciously very wary of rape and um any type of interaction with strangers. And that's something that like no dating coaches really ever really talk about. And they go into all these like unconscious, uh, scientific reasons for this and, um, how to address it. Like you have to actually, uh, show trustworthiness and safety and maybe even have a first date with a group of people or in a public setting. And those are things that most people don't address. There's all these like really cool things in the book that like w- are never addressed before and go against what's like commonly understood. Uh, and it's, it's really reputable, highly scientific and fact-based, which is not what's been done uh, at all. So great book. Those are my 10 uh, books to read if you could only read 10 for the rest of your life. Now, of course, uh, it was really tough for me to whittle down this list to 10. So I actually have six other extra books, bonus books to mention, uh, that are honorable mentions. So I'll uh, move through these quickly, or at least I'll try to. The first is Tap Dancing to Work by, um, I, I think her name's Carol Loomis. And it's a book uh, about Warren Buffett and, uh, Carol is the, I, I thought, I believe she, she was the editor of Fortune uh, magazine until she retired, which is a very famous magazine, uh, that's entrepreneur and wealth focused. And, uh, the book is mainly a collection of articles about Warren Buffett, uh, plus commentary on Warren Buffett through Carol, who had a, um, insider's perspective of 
who he was as a person because um, they knew each other. And what makes this book really good, and you know, I was really tempted to add this to this list. In fact, it was, it's probably the number one book um, I would add to this list if I could. And the reason is, is because um, Warren Buffett as a person, uh, he has taught me so much about living a successful life beyond just money. Uh, there's a money manager, his name's Monish Prabhai, and he said it best. Uh, he said that um, the greatest things about Warren Buffett have nothing to do with money. Uh, I think it's it's hard to explain exactly, but you know, I I got into personal development first uh, through a, a few videos about Warren Buffett online, and then I just consumed everything about him. And I mean, he he really talks a lot about life and what success means to him. And again, I've touched on it more deeply in other podcasts, but essentially, like he says stuff like how you know what's more important is like who. You want to love you, actually love you when you die. Your relationships, you know, are you doing something that you love, that you tap dance to work in the mornings every day? Uh, and I think this book uh, explains what I have a hard time explaining in words, um, what I like to call true success is in life, which goes far beyond just money. Uh, the entrepreneur Ramit Sethi, I think... Um, a lot of successful people, once they've achieved money, they stumble across this as well, or at least some of them do when they search for it. But um, I think the entrepreneur Ramit Sethi, uh, he wrote a book too called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. It's a very well-known personal finance book. Uh, and he He's a multi maybe not multi, but he's a millionaire and owner and founder of a multi-million dollar business. And... Uh, he has this uh, saying that he always says, uh, and it goes something like this. A rich life is more than just money. Uh, and it's it's so true. I, I really do think that, uh, you know, for him, Ramit, he really understands this because he, just like Warren Buffett, like he values relationships, uh, impacting others. Enjoying your work, making a difference, living a happy life, you know, being there for your children, not having any regrets in life, not holding back, doing what you've always wanted to do, uh, not letting other people's desires, your parents, other people's uh, impositions on you uh, completely determine what you do for a living. And those ideals um are very different from not just um what my parents or other asian parents tell their children uh which i see all over the place i would say like i know like i would say most of my asian friends i'm asian by the way if you didn't know most of my asian friends um they have been affected affected by this as well because most of them are on the way or already pharmacists, doctors, etc., uh, etc. Et I would say I've also not only those people, but white, black, Indian, um, Hispanic, every ethnicity I've seen they follow the exact same trend, and maybe it's because earlier. In human civilization, it wasn't practical. But um, those, the reason why I was so impacted by tap dancing to work was because uh, it was very different from what I thought was possible. And it's liberating. It gave me hope. It gave me the idea that I could actually live an amazing life. Now, it's not easy. It, it really is not easy. It's tough. Um but I think it's doable. It's possible. And now more than any time in history, I see more and more of these, more more and more and more people achieving it. I mean, I see it all the time on YouTube, all the time. Like all these YouTubers, like there's thousands of YouTubers now who make a lot of money 
and they they play video games for a living on YouTube or, or and stuff like that. And of course, there's a lot more hard work behind the scenes. They often spend more time editing uh, than actually playing video games. But nonetheless, I think um, it is possible more and more now in the modern world. So that's why I think tap dancing work really just shook me to my core. Uh, another book I recommend is Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, this is simply a book on networking. Um, it really uh, opens your eyes on how to become a better networker and also uh, kind of changes your idea and opinions about networking uh, because some people think it's kind of sleazy, but uh, he kind of shows you that, hey, it's not as sleazy as you think. It's actually, uh, if done properly, it's a beneficial relationship to everyone and this guy who wrote it, I mean, he is just a, uh, I don't know if he's a genius networker or just someone who is insanely good at what he does. Uh, but I mean, he has so many connections with rich, powerful, successful people, uh, through his networking skills. Uh, and I think it's something where you should double down on your strengths. Networking is definitely not one of mine. But I do think, you know, it's something to note if I ever get into that situation. And um, it really opened my eyes to the power of networking, uh, which I never really uh, accounted as uh, such a valuable skill before. But it so much is. Uh, so if you want to be a good networker or you think you have a knack for it, that's a must read. Next one is Essentialism. Uh, this book is a very short read. It's probably the shortest out of all the books I've mentioned here. And I would think it's, it's a very simple minimalist book on productivity. And that's what makes it great. I would say it, a counterpart that kind of does the same thing is a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. As you can kind of tell by the titles, um, there's a whole theme to the book, both of those books is uh, just focus on the most number one most important task that you have to do and do it at the very beginning of your day and say no to everything else until you finish that and then rinse and repeat. Uh, the whole book could be summarized like that, but I think reading it is worth it because they give all this uh, support to prove their claim or make it more clear uh, and once you read all those reasons, it might help you actually do it rather than just read it and not do it. Uh, next book I recommend is one I actually just finished a few days ago. Uh, this is another honorable mention, The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Now, I was very skeptical about uh, the author and then the table was completely turned. I really like the book. It's incredible now. And the reason for the flip and the initial skepticism was because I first uh, heard about him through his interviews on the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast show. And what I didn't really like about it was like he started like giving all this advice on like investing and all these other things. And I'm like, uh, dude, you're a chess player. Like, does it doesn't mean like you can give all this advice on all these other things in life. Uh, I think Tim was kind of like pushing him to do so. Uh, so I can't say it was completely fair, but, um, uh, I was a bit skeptical of kind of both of them, Tim and, uh, Josh Waitskin. And, uh, what changed it for me was, uh, I really wanted to get better at learning. I had taken the strengths finders test and learning had come up numerous times as my number one and or number two best strength. If you don't know what Strengths Finder is, it there's it's a book and it comes with a paid online uh strengths test. And there's all these there's like fifty different strengths that you could have. And for me, a learner always comes up like first or second. So um then I started running into people uh, teachers in real life that were telling me that I was really good at learning and I hadn't, you know, hinted that I had taken a personality test or anything. They just mentioned it. Uh, I think one was a fitness, uh, coach. Uh, second one was a, um, a jujitsu coach. 
and a third one was another martial arts coach. And they they all kind of said that I was a fast learner. I picked things up quickly. And I, I was very smooth with learning. Uh, and it made it very easy to teach. And so when I, my ears started perking up when I heard this. And I'm like, uh, I got to do what I've been hearing all these successful people tell me. Double down on your strength. So that's when I heard about Josh Waiskin's book, The Art of Learning, um, which is incredible. And I think even if you're not a learner like me, everyone can benefit from being able to learn better because um, the first big blunder most people make is they stop learning as soon as they graduate, which gives their competitors 80 years until they die to you know, get better and better than you because they're learning while you're not. The second big mistake is they're not learning effectively or efficiently, which I think everyone can improve upon if they just knew a few basic principles. And so, uh, Josh, his, if you don't know who he is, he's a, uh, world class chess player. He was like, he was the U.S. and world champion under 18 and 21. And then he became the world champion in a uh, martial art called Tai Chi Chuan. Right after that, it took him maybe like four years to do so. Uh, and he fought people who spent their entire lives training in that martial arts. So how did he become world class at two things so quickly? Well, uh, he argues that he was, what made him do so was the that he was good at learning it wasn't that he was talented at something specifically but he was good at learning and so he he goes through this book and gives all this advice on how you can learn better and i thought it was incredibly helpful and i think anyone can benefit from doing this now this book also has some things i didn't like about it uh for example The whole fact that I think Tai Chi Chuan and chess are very similar. On the outside, they might not seem so, but on the inside, they really are. They both require a lot of uh, outthinking the opponent, thinking many moves ahead. There's a lot of counters to any type of attack. It's an offensive versus defensive game. And that's actually a bad thing because... uh, You know, he has really mastered two very similar skills, which means, you know, he could be uh, underweighing the importance of his chess talent as well as the fact that a lot of his chess skill was transferable to another skill. And because of that, he could be saying that, oh, you can achieve mastery at any skill by using these universal learning principles I'm about to teach you when that's not actually true. Now, having said that, you know, as the skeptic I am, um, I do think nonetheless that some of his learning principles could still be applied universally, which is why I still uh, recommended this book. Uh, for example, I used to compete uh, on the state level for piano and... I did notice that some of his principles worked for piano as well uh, because I, I played piano competitively. So uh, some of this stuff he says still does apply, which is why I think uh, despite my skepticism about some things, still worth an honorable mention. The next honorable mention book I want to give is Success Through Stillness by Russell Simmons. Russell Simmons is a hip-hop mogul. He's uh, a very successful, wealthy uh musician in the hip-hop space uh he's not well known these days but uh i didn't know about him but when i picked up his book apparently he was like really well known with all the other rappers back in the day and uh he wrote his first book on how he achieved success and got rich and how it was basically a book teaching normal people and his friends how they could become rich as well uh the book you know, I read it. It wasn't that good. There's a lot of generic stuff in there. Uh, but then I read his next book, Success Through Stillness, and that one blew my mind. It really was the book that was the turning point that convinced me to meditate. And basically, uh, he was already rich, very 
wealthy and successful, but he was severely addicted to hard drugs, like the hardest of drugs, cocaine, heroin, and very consumed by these superficial things in life, uh, sleeping with new women every night. And uh, he just didn't feel satisfied. Then, you know, someone convinced him to do meditation and yoga. He really didn't want to. He didn't think it was cool. He did. He thought it would like wreck his life. It ended up saving his life and changing his whole life. He His business, like 50x or something crazy from there, he got a lot more uh, wealthy, and successful, happy, and um, it saved his mind because uh, those hard drugs really like destroy your mind and slow down your thinking. But uh, meditation uh, really saved his. And he, he pretty much concluded the book uh, by uh, saying that, uh, you know, you can achieve similar success by meditating. And he credits a lot of his success to meditating. And he also, I think the book also did a great job of uh, dispelling some myths about meditation. And that's really what pushed me over the edge to start meditating myself. Uh, he, he points to the fact that it's not spiritual. It's it's fundamentally just concentrating on your breath and pushing out thoughts when they come in. And it's something that doesn't take a lot of sophisticated effort to do. Uh, so that really pushed me over. And there, there's health uh, and focus benefits too, uh, scientifically. And uh, I think the last big thing about the book that really struck me was uh, Russell... Uh, his background and his way of talking really just, um, it's, it's so, I mean, I wouldn't say down to earth because I wouldn't say I grew up in the ghetto and I, you know, talk, I, I talk with the best of the hip hop rappers. Uh, but, um, nonetheless, it, it really, I think speaks home to anyone who's really skeptical about all this, um, any type of personal development or meditation type stuff because, I mean, the way he talks, he uses slang, and it really speaks to anyone who uh, is really cool and into hip hop, and because and it, you relate to him, and because of that, it draws you in and convinces you that maybe there is some merit to some of this self help stuff. Uh, I have two more honorable mentions, and that's it. Uh, the next one's Richest Man in Babylon. Again, I think it's an in-between book between uh, the beginner book, which is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the more advanced books, Laws of Success and Millionaire Next Door. Um, it's really a moderate read. It's not too long. And it just touches on some of uh, some very foundational principles of how to build wealth. Uh, very simple stuff, but nonetheless very important. Um I wrote a blog article that summarizes the points from the book, which you can find if you just use my search, the search function on my site. Uh, again, the site is willyoulaugh.com, spelled as it sounds correctly. Uh, so you can check that out if you're too lazy to read the book. And then the final honorable mention is actually, I think it deserves a lot of praise uh, because has gotten a lot of praise. This book is by Jack Welch. He's the CEO of GE General Electric, or he was, uh, and he took that company from a failing, uh, declining multi-billion dollar company uh, that was like literally like losing tons of money and not sure what to do into like this thriving, a really successful business. And of course, in the business world, he is like a superstar. Everyone knows him. Uh, He's sought after because of what he did uh, with GE, uh, he spent like his whole life there. Uh, he's a very successful guy, and uh, he wrote a book, winning. Like his, he wrote other business books, but this is a book geared towards anyone, anyone who's an employee. You don't have to run a business, um, but it's a book that covers everything. Like if if you're a manager or if you run a business, it's also really helpful. There's like tips on that, um, but it's helpful for employees too, and it's just like this. It's also a book on careers, finding your passion, the truth about that, as I've uh, hinted at earlier uh, on this episode of the podcast. Um, it's an all-around great book. And I mean, it, if you look at just the cover, it has all these like 
quotes and praise from really successful people. You got a quote from Warren Buffett, Bill Gates. Warren Buffett says it's like the best, you know, uh, management book of all time that no other manage book, management book needs to ever be written. Uh, I mean, you can't get better than that. And I heard about it for years. Uh, finally picked it up, assuming it'd be like one of those like, um, tougher to read, dense, long books. But I mean, he makes it so simple and conversational. He doesn't use any fancy words. And it's, it's so simple and easy to get through. It's short too, uh, that I'm, I'm very amazed at how he did it. I think it's, it, it speaks to the fact that like he knows how to boil down complex topics into simple things as well as speak to the person on the other side without overcomplicating it. So I really recommend that book, Winning by Jack Welch. Um, I think, uh, just to conclude with all of these books, uh, you know, I've met people who have read them, but then like when you quiz them on it, uh, like they can't remember 95% of the book. They haven't taken action on a hundred percent of it. So, uh, don't just read the books. If you do read this, promise you'll take action on at least one thing. And even like I've gone back to taking notes. So maybe just like if you can, or if you want to spend five seconds to write down some notes on one big thing you learn so that you imprint it further into your memory and you actually remember uh, what you learn and you actually take action and benefit from it. I think a lot of people uh, think reading it is enough and they just forget it afterwards. So I think that's really important. Again, don't just read it. And if this, I'm going to stop it right here, but if you found this useful at all, Please uh, go to iTunes and leave a rating and review on my podcast. It will really help um, get my podcast noticed more. I actually set up an URL that you can go to directly that will redirect you straight to uh, my iTunes page where you can leave the rating and review. And that URL is willyoulaugh.com slash podcast. It's exactly as it sounds. That's how it's spelled. That's W-I-L-L-Y-O-U. L-A-U-G-H dot com slash P-O-D-C-A-S-T and that will redirect you to my iTunes page. That's all I got to say and of course, uh, if you want the most exclusive knowledge bombs uh, similar to what I've dropped here on this podcast, uh, of course, please go join my insider list. It's free but it does require a little bit of work on your end. Go to my site, willyoulaugh.com and on the sidebar, you can enter your email which will uh, sign you up for my insider's email list, which will uh, send you some of the top things and most useful things I've learned. And of course, you will get immediately some bonus packs uh, when you sign up. Uh, of course, um, there's all sorts of like email opt-ins uh, on my site if you look for them. Any of them that you sign up for, uh, if you enter your email, you will join my insider's list. Uh, there's one where if like you scroll halfway down the page, um, it'll pop up. Uh, but again, please do that if you want to improve your life. It's for your benefit. Again, you will not be spammed. Uh, and that's all I got to say. Thanks so much. And I hope you stay subscribed to this podcast because uh, more awesome stuff coming your way. Of course, already plenty of awesome podcast episodes already released. So if you haven't listen to all of them, listen to them. If you have, maybe listen to them again to really burn them into your head. And of course, new fresh podcast episodes coming out every month. Thanks so much. And I will see you in the next episode of this podcast. Peace.